Welcome to The Greg Bennett Show. I'm your host, Greg Bennett. And well, today I have the privilege to chat with one of the most knowledgeable and wisest men I think I've ever spoken with, Dr. Joseph Maroon. In this episode, Dr. Maroon shares his journey from riding high with success in his chosen profession of being a neurosurgeon to losing everything, to finding triathlon and how triathlon literally saved his life and how he was able to rebuild himself physically, mentally, and emotionally. He concludes the show by sharing what he feels are the most important things in life. And he asks himself this question, what are the three most important things in life? And he says, one, a healthy mind and healthy body. Two, relationships with God, family, and friends. And three, carpe diem, Latin for seize the day. And Dr. Maroon is living what he's sharing. He is living his life with vigor. He is seizing the day and he truly is inspiring. Now, before we go on, I just want to say a special thank you to all of you for sharing the show on your social platforms and for all the feedback and suggestions. Thank you also for supporting the show by by using the show's sponsors, products. Uh, You really can't go wrong with Athletic Greens and Hyper Ice. I hope you enjoyed this one as much as I did. And remember, success comes to those who endure just one moment longer. I'm so grateful for the continued support of the show from these incredible sponsors. You really do need to have these products in your life. Personally, I use each of them daily. Athletic Greens, Nutritional Beverage, Hyper Ice Recovery Tools, and the Glutathione Supplement, Continual G. What I love about Athletic Greens is its simplicity. It's delivered straight to your door and it takes seconds to mix with water. It tastes great and goes down easy. And I know I'm getting the most comprehensive nutritional beverage on the planet in one quick drink. If you're looking for one product that has as much high quality nutrients in it as possible, then you want to consider Athletic Greens. Athletic Greens is more than just a multivitamin and multimineral. It takes it to the next level adding a daily dose of superfoods, probiotics, greens blend, and more to support the gut health, energy, immunity, and stress. And right now, Athletic Greens is giving you, my audience, a special offer on top of their all-in-one formula. You'll receive one year supply of vitamin D and five travel packs for free with your first purchase for additional immune support. Many of the population are vitamin D deficient, including myself. I focus heavily in getting in the sun throughout the day, but when I can't, I religiously supplement with vitamin D. Adding vitamin D to your daily routine is just a great way to support vitamin D production. So if you're looking to get more out of your multivitamin and invest in your immunity, energy, and gut health, then you'll struggle to find anything more comprehensive than athletic greens. Take ownership of your health today and receive comprehensive nutritional insurance, a free year supply of vitamin D, and five free travel packs with your first purchase by visiting athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. Now, you'll hear me mention Normatec and Hypervolt from Hyperice in several of the conversations with my guests in this show. Many of my guests and I are using these recovery tools religiously. You really must have them in your house. Sit in a pair of Normatec boots at the end of a long day. Use the Hypervolt percussion massage device to warm up muscles and loosen hot spots before working out or anytime you have a niggling injury. They're just so easy and they're so quick and they work. Their vibrating foam rollers, thermal technology and Normatec compression systems just help you warm up faster, recover quicker and simply move better. Seriously, these products are the perfect Christmas gift for any family member or good friend. Get $50 off all percussion devices now, no code needed, and get an additional 10% off with code GREG10 at hyperice.com. That's hyperice.com, H-Y-P-E-R-I-C-E.com, and use code GREG10 for 10% off. I have a web address for all of my listeners who already know that one, the human body makes the most powerful antioxidants on earth. Two, the master antioxidant your body cells make is called glutathione and the human body needs glutathione to live. Three, the reason I'm addressing a select group of listeners with this web address is that once you see what these scientists in my hometown, Sydney, have accomplished, it'll blow your mind. Go check out continualg.com, continualg.com. Dot com. That's C-O-N-T-I-N-U-A-L-G dot com. 
check it out and let them know that I told you about it. All right, today's guest is one of the most accomplished people I've had the pleasure of having on the show, neurosurgeon, professor, triathlete, and author. As a neurosurgeon, he has an international referral base, including numerous professional athletes and celebrities. As a sports medicine expert, he's been the team neurosurgeon for the NFL Pittsburgh Steelers for 30 years and the first neurosurgeon directly appointed to the NFL. He's the co-developer of IMPACT, a new neurocognitive test that is now the standard of care for concussion management in the NFL, the NHL, MLB, and NASCAR. He's a renowned author of seven books. His most recent, which we'll be discussing today, is called Square One, A Simple Guide to a Balanced Life. And he's a triathlete, eight-time Ironman athlete, including five Kona Ironman World Championships. What an absolute pleasure and privilege to have him on the show. So welcome and thanks for joining me on the Greg Benner Show, Dr. Joseph Maroon. How are you, mate? Well, I'm I'm very well, thank you, Greg. It's a great pleasure to be on with you. And uh, you know, I've admired you and your wife's accomplishments in the field of triathlons, and uh, I'm looking forward to our discussion. Oh, thanks, mate. Yeah, it's uh, it's taken us a little bit these last few weeks. We uh, you were, you were a little bit ill there for a little bit. And then I suddenly became ill and we had to keep postponing this show. And, and finally we're sitting here chatting together. So I really appreciate you that, you know, for hanging in there and, and, uh, being patient with me to get, get healthy again. Well, both of us, I, uh, <laughs> you know, interestingly, I came down with it about three weeks ago. Uh, and it was three weeks after I got my initial vaccination shot thinking I was protected. But oh. as we as we now know, and I know now know, you really don't get protected from this with your vaccinations for up to six to eight weeks afterwards. So that uh, it's no guarantee that you're not going to got not going to catch the virus, and also no guarantee that you won't catch it again. So it's a potentially deadly thing that's certainly uh, destroying an awful lot of people's jobs and families and and work. How was it for you? I mean, were you able to keep working? Or I mean, no, was the, I, what was, I had what the... significant myalgia, Martin mm. fatigue. I uh, just wanted to sleep, and uh, but I, but I took several products, several things that uh, vitamin D, selenium, zinc, quercetin, and, mm. and also products from a company called CV Sciences, called uh, CV Acute, and uh, and CV Maintenance. These are these are supplements that really were very good in terms of anti-inflammatory and building up mm-hmm. immunity. Mm-hmm. So that uh, that plus I got the antibody, the IV infusion of the Lilly antibody, which I think in combination, plus I, I hopefully had a fairly strong immune system beforehand, got me over it quickly and, and back to normal, thank God. Yeah, I mean, what you just listed out and every the symptoms you had are basically what I had for about nine days. Um, just absolute fatigue. Look, if I didn't have a one year old and a three year old at home, I think I would have been fine just sleeping at Elf. And and it actually, the symptoms weren't painful by any means. Um, it was just, uh, it's given me a new empathy for people that yeah. you know talk about chronic fatigue and this kind of thing. I, I don't think I'd ever felt fatigue quite like it. Um, I haven't been gone and get got tested, so I actually don't know that 100% that I did have it. It sounds like it was fairly simple, similar. But like you, I, I just loaded on the vitamin C, the vitamin D, quercetin, zinc. Um, I went almost full ketosis with my diet. I really reduced, got all the carbohydrates and refined sugars completely out of my out of my diet. Um, I doubled down on Athletic Greens, which you know is yeah. uh, 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 they sponsor this show, but it's also a product that I use daily. And I found all of those I think got me on track fairly quick. Um, don't get me wrong, there was there was a number of days there where I was like, ah, oh, help, <laughs> you know, and especially when you got a, a three year old that wants daddy to take you to the the swimming pool and you just you know you're struggling to get out of bed. But um, it's nice to be on the other side of it. Um, you know, and and a bit like you, it's like okay, we got the antibodies now. Um, h- how do we move forward with it? You know, yeah. Um, but anyway, let's have a little bit of a look. Firstly, at your triathlon career. You know, you mentioned your, you know, like I said in the show, you eight time Ironman athlete. Um, you're still competing right now. I am. In fact, I you know I was thinking, do I want to continue to compete and. 
uh, I over the Christmas holidays, I, I wrestled with a very, very important decision. Do I want to get a new bike? <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew if I got a new bike, I'd have to use it and compete. So I bought a new bike, a new Trek. What did you, what did you get? I, I got the Trek uh, triathlon bike. And, yeah, yeah. uh, so I'm going to get it actually this next week and put it on my trainer and, and start getting ready for the spring and, and summer. Oh, you're awesome. So what age group are you in now? Well, I'm in 80 and over. 80 and right. over. They, they stopped doing five-year categories after 80. I think, yes, they did. In fact, I, I came in first in my age group this past fall in a triathlon. And uh, I don't tell most people this, but I was also last because I was the only one in my age group. <laughs> I, I have a good, I, <laughs> I have a good shot of of placing if I continue to compete. Now, do you know my father in law, Paul Reback? Because he he turns eighty next month, and he's still mad triathlete down here in South Florida. Really? And I think you guys. Looking at your doing a little bit of homework, I think 2003 when you did yep. Kona Ironman World Championships, I think yep. my father-in-law Paul did it as well. Now, I believe he finished 11th in the age group back in 2003. So I was, I was curious to, to see if you guys know each other because I know, I know your age group is actually very competitive with each other. I, I, I kind of love it. Um, and, and I was asking, you know, Paul, do you know, do you know Dr. Joseph Maroon? And, and he's kind of looking up results and, you know, going back through through the book. So I don't know if you guys have just missed each other. or I, but I, I, know don't, recall, I don't recall meeting him, mm. but uh, I, I'm sure if we can get there again to, this year, we will. Absolutely. I think that 80-year-old plus group is going to be very competitive <laughs> in 2021. I love it, mate. I love it. I want to stick to my throat to say that, though, Greg. I want you to know that. I can't believe it. You know, how did, this, how did this happen? <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? It happens quick, isn't it? Well, uh, I mean, you quick, guys are... I'm, I'm, I'm quick to add, though, that I, I'm, I'm extremely blessed and fortunate to to be where I am, you know, to be on the, as they say, the right side of the grass, but also how, what an important major place triathlons have played in my life. Mm. And, and we can talk about that as we go forward, but, uh, my getting over the COVID and, and the way I'm still able to function and what I'm doing now, very, very active, uh, is due in major part to, the balance in my life that triathlons have provided. Mm. I couldn't agree more. I think I think for all of us, it's not just the balance of the physical. I think it's the the social and the people that surround us. I think it's the the greatest community of people that you could ever be around. You know, the fact that we're we're talking here on my show is the fact. You know, we we have cross age groups. Um, you know, we're all experiencing the same thing. We're all testing ourselves and trying to look over the look over the edge that we you know and peer over and testing ourselves and going beyond where we've been before and I think it's a it's a really is a a great sport for that. I also saw that Muncie 2012. I think you and I might have been in the same race. Yeah. Uh, and that was the one where they shortened it when it was incredibly hot. It was, yep. That was brutal, yeah. <laughs> that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I like that. I was very happy they shortened it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was 110 degrees or something yeah. or 45 degrees Celsius and it was a brutal day. But anyway, what I'd like to do now is is wind the clock back and if you'd mind just sharing your journey a little bit and, and letting us all get to know you and, and what you've been through to get to this point um, and specifically even, you know, to the point of writing square one, a basic guide for a balanced life, um, you know, and the burnout that you experienced and those kinds of things. So would you mind just uh, take, get, get, taking a few minutes and just taking us through your journey a little bit? No, absolutely. I, you know, I just happened to write a, an editorial for the local newspaper, just finished it this week. I, I grew up in Bridgeport, Ohio, 5,000 people, 20 bars and 30 dogs. Uh, and I actually played sports early on with two people, one by the name of John Havlicek uh, and another Phil Necro. John Havlicek and I and Phil played on the same American Legion baseball team together. John went to Ohio State where he was All-American, All-Pro, 
and played for the Boston Celtics Hall of Fame. And Phil Necro was the best knuckleball pitcher in the country ever uh, for the Atlanta Braves and is in the Hall of Fame. And all three of us are in the Lou Holtz Hall of Fame here um, in, in Eastern Ohio. But oh. so I had a sports background, went away to Indiana University, played football at IU, and, uh, and then med school and residency at uh, Georgetown, Oxford University in England, Indiana University, University of Vermont, came to Pittsburgh and was on a quest to be the very best neurosurgeon that I could be and, uh, and, and really pushed very hard. And after about 10 years, I, I had accomplished what I wanted to in terms of success. And I, I put success in quotes because I had attained some recognition and some notoriety, uh, had, had earned a, a few dollars and uh, had a family and a wife and everything seemed to be going along well. But there was one thing that I did wrong and I'll, and I'll talk about. So at about the age of 40, 43, within a course of a week, my father died of a heart attack at age 60. Oh, wow. uh, my wife left me with our two children in the middle of winter oh, geez. and I had to quit neurosurgery uh, because I was simply emotionally too unstable to operate on people's brains and spines. And I recognized that. And uh, uh, my father had a truck stop that he bequeathed to my mother, an old dilapidated up <laughs> in Wheeling, West Virginia. And I literally moved in with my mother and worked in the truck stop, uh, filling up 18 wheelers, flipping hamburgers and, and wondering how in the world I went from one week doing brain surgery on awake patients for tumors wow. and then pumping gas and filling up 18 wheelers the next. So it was the nadir, the absolute bottom of my life. There's a, a, a writer <clears throat> who, who said, every man uh, has a, write, writes his own story in his diary. And his saddest and humblest day is when he compares the story as he meant it to be with how it was. Mm. And when I was working in that truck stop, I, I could not imagine that this is where I would end up. And I had no idea, uh, antidepressants, therapy, nothing seemed to be able to get me out of the incredible depression and funk that I was in. Mm. And one day the banker who owned the mortgage on the truck stop called me and said, Joe, let's go for a run. And I, I think he wanted to see if I'd be around long enough to pay off the mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I said, I run. I said, I can't walk up a flight of stairs without getting short of breath. I'm 20 pounds overweight. Uh, but I, I managed to find a pair of scrubs and a pair of tennis shoes. We went down to the local high school track in Tridelphia, West Virginia. And I made it around four times. I thought I'd die. Uh, and I said, never again, that's enough for me. But that night was the first night I slept in about four months. Hmm. So the next day I actually went down myself and I did a mile and a quarter. And then the next day, a mile and a half, and then just kept incrementally increasing till I got up to six, seven, eight miles. And at that time, I read about triathlons. Mm -hmm. And uh, Judy, who Julie, who was Julie's last name? Crawley. Julie Moss. Julie Moss. Yeah. Julie Moss. Mm -hmm. I, I I read across about Julie Moss crawling across the finish line, and I thought, well, I think I'm going to learn to swim and cross train. So I learned to swim. Got some lessons at the local Y. Wow. And you're 40. This is when you're mid forties, right? Mid 40s. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, got a bike, old bike with balloon tires. 
<laughs> and uh, started riding and swimming. And then I entered into a Tin Man triathlon. Mm. And it was like Roger Bannister completing a four minute mile. The, the high, the dopamine, the endocannabinoids, and, and the other neurotransmitters that got rebalanced in my life uh, came in the elevated serotonin levels without SSRIs. And I said, wow. And, and I realized that the unintended side effect of doing that physical activity and cross training rebalanced my mind, meaning my neurotransmitters, mm. my connectome, the wiring diagram of the brain. I dropped weight unintentionally, but to a good normal weight. My diet improved, no more truck stop food. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I was like Sidney Carton in The Tale of Two Cities. I was recalled to life. And I, I continue to kind of raise the bar each year. I was able to get back to neurosurgery after a full year of being away. And, and really entered into the most important part of my life. And I, in retrospect, you know, I look back and I said, you know, where, where did I go wrong? What happened mm, mm. that all these things occurred? Not only the death of a parent, but the end up ending of a marriage mm. and uh, an inability to, to do neurosurgery after 15 years of training. Wow. Uh, and, and what it was, it was pretty simple. Uh, I wasn't mindful or aware of not only what I was doing, but why I was doing it. Mm. You know, I was pursuing success at almost any cost and at the cost of ignoring or really not participating like I should have in my family. I fell away from my spiritual moorings in terms of my upbringing. I had sisters of charity for 12 years of grade school and high school and a very strong Roman Catholic background that I kind of fell away from. So the spirituality dropped and the physical side. Also, I, I was overweight, out of shape, not paying attention to the mind body connection. Mm. So Putting all that together, in retrospect, I looked back and I, I ended up writing the book Square One, A Simple Guide to a Balanced Life. And, and basically, you know, anybody listening to this, this, ca this podcast, I want you to stop for just a minute and I want you to do something right now. I want you to draw a square in your mind. On the top line, I want you to write the word work. On the sidebar down on the right, write the word family and social. And on the bottom line, write the word spiritual. And on the line on the left, write the word physical. Now, I want you to think how much effort, not necessarily time, but how much effort you put into each one of these sides on a daily basis. Mm. The work is a pretty much given. Mm -hmm. We know we're going to exert ourselves in that space. But what about our family? Where, where does our family come in in terms of our true time, commitment, and effort? And what about spirituality? I find that this is one that's the easiest to as they say, slip sliding away. <laughs> uh, you, you forget really what's my purpose. What's it all about, Alfie? You know, what's my role? What should I be doing in this life and how should I be doing it? The mm -hmm. philosophical thing of it. And, and the mindfulness and the awareness that we need to have on a daily basis. And then what am I going to do physically to touch the physical side every day? or five days a week, or three days a week. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be a triathlete, but it absolutely is essential to 
have that aspect of it in your life. And we can talk forever, Greg, about the the mind-body connection and how the mind can make the body sick. Mm -hmm. Gastric ulcers, irritable bowel syndrome, heart attacks. But the body can also make the mind sick. Your microbiome, how you how you feed the the bacteria in your own gut, which forms seventy five percent of your immunity, mm-hmm. and and the bi directional connection between your brain or your mind and your body through the vagus nerve, uh, which connects both the largest nerve in the body. So mm-hmm. I ended up writing the book Square One, A Simple Guide to a Balanced Life. And it's touching on each one of those subjects, the work, the family, the spiritual, and the physical side of your body, and how how essential each are, and how we need to be mindful and aware of the significance of each if we are to attain balance or homeostasis Mm-hmm. in our lives and in our body. So that's a kind of an extended summary right. that we can that's, discuss if you would like. That that's that's absolutely fantastic and I think that's the best triathlon journey I've heard uh on this on this podcast uh, of all the people that I've spoken with. I just think that's a remarkable journey uh, and I think you've touched on so much there that I do want to dive into, you know, a lot more detail. Um, I particularly love the addressing of what's important. Um, you know, I often sit with clients and we, we, we say, you know, tell me what's important in your life. And, and everybody's quick to put their hand up and say, family and my kids, you know, because that's what we're meant to say. Right. And then I'm like, well, how many hours a week are you at work? Oh, 60 to 80 hours a week. How many hours are you with your kids? Yeah, about eight hours. Now I agree with you. It doesn't have to resemble it doesn't have to be more hours with your family but that time that you're having with them i just feel like we need to get the priorities right um and that doesn't mean i'm not telling people to stop working and working hard and and enjoying what they do and have purpose with what they're doing for work but focus on truly what's important so family as you said the spiritual side mindfulness grounding all of those sort of things that Science is now proving, we've known for thousands of years, I just had a, an athlete on, Rebecca Rush, and we were discussing that in last week's episode of how basically the Bible or Buddha or whatever spiritual being background you have, yeah. this information's been there for thousands of years. Now science is proving it. <laughs> you know, and It's like these books, these amazing books were written and, and now we, we know that it's, it does work. The, the mind over the body and like you said, the gut biome, the body over the mind, it's just tremendous. Let's just have a quick step back though and discuss what burnout is scientifically. I mean, you you discussed dopamine levels and serotonin all increased and that kind of thing when, when you found triathlon. The burnout that led to depression for you, if we were to break it down scientifically, what, what would you say burnout is? Well, let, let me first say that triathlon saved my life. I mean, I was I love it. having suicidal ideation. What's it all about? You know, where am I going? My life's ruined. But it was the unintended side effect that occurred with the running, the biking, and the swimming that, as I said, reset my neurochemicals, my dopamine and, and endocannabinoids and acetylcholine. So it, it, it saved my life in that regard. But the, you, the state I was in, I was in the prototypical burnout state, overwhelmed, overcommitted, overextended, completely out of balance. And basically what that means is the definition of burnout is it, it's associated with Physical and emotional exhaustion, Mm. physical and or emotional exhaustion with a feeling of life is not worth it. My job, what's it all about? It's not, what am I doing? What am I accomplishing? And thirdly, you become cynical, you become uh, irritable, 
and mood changes. So all of these things are the symptoms of burnout. And I was just reading in the medical profession associated with this pandemic now, 48 to 50 percent of physicians are in that state or experience some aspect of it, overwhelmed, wow. overworked, overcommitted. And the suicide rate in physicians is is going up as well as it is in the general public, as well as it is in our kids, mm-hmm. the youth, because they don't know how to cope with uh, with the stresses that are occurring now and the radical changes in our lives with jobs lost and, uh, and disintegration of, of many families. So that's burnout. Mm. When, we, when we are unable to develop resilience. So what is resilience? How do you develop resilience? Well, Greg, you know as well, just as well, if not better than I, you can only develop resilience if there's stress. Mm -hmm. You must be stressed to develop resilience. And we, in the Nietzsche quote, that which does not kill me makes me stronger. Uh, But, you know, you don't need to be killed to get stronger. But again, that's where the, the, the physical and the spiritual and the family are the greatest anti-stressors that we can invoke. Mm. So what happens when our body is stressed? You may recall Hans Selye, who is a great Mm -hmm. Canadian physiologist who wrote a book entitled You Stress, meaning EU stress versus distress. You stress, EU in Greek means good. So there's good stress, and then there's distress or bad stress. And if you draw a curve, uh, there's a point at which good stress becomes distress, and then that's the downside of the, of the curve. And we must be able to recognize when we're in this burnout state cognitively and aware and be aware of it. Only if you're aware of it, are you going to be able to deal with it? I wasn't aware of what I had done to myself until I crashed and literally burned out. But it was my own doing, my own ambition, my own ego that was pushing me uh, to get the, the medals, so to speak, in neurosurgery Mm. and how empty they were when I did get them, but I lost everything else. So what's the biblical saying? What is a man if he gains the world and loses his soul? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, it's, and it's easy to do and, and we see it very frequently in others as well as ourselves. So, that's a little bit on your yeah so do you think i mean like you said the depression and suicide rates uh, and the general public they are increasing uh do you think it's because we're not turning off we're not grounding ourselves we're not finding that parasympathetic you know relax and and recover type phase anymore i i had dr tommy wood on this this uh show a number of weeks ago and we were talking about exactly this you know we were talking about resilience and stress and if it becomes chronic stress and that kind of thing and and the importance of of trying to get ourselves to that parasympathetic nervous nervous and, and we've always got these six inch you know phones in our hands we've always we're always on and i feel like there needs to be this these templates of how do we know that we're always on, switch ourselves off and and take full control of the controllables around us. I mean, and that's partly it, isn't it? I mean, just well, taking it, control of your life. It, it's actually, you know, you, you touched on a key thing that we can discuss a little bit semi-medically, if you would, the parasympathetic nervous system mm. versus the sympathetic nervous system. Mm. And the sympathetic nervous system is the fight or flight uh, response we have with any 
real or perceived threat to ourselves. And that's where the cortisol goes up, the adrenaline goes up, our heart rate goes up, our blood pressure goes up. And when chronic, it obviously leads to very bad things for our body and brain. And that's the sympathetic. And the parasympathetic system, as the listeners of this show, I'm sure know, is that system that gets engaged when we meditate. It's the rest and digest side, not the fight or flight. So when we meditate, if we pray, if we use Shin Roku, the Japanese nature walking, Mm -hmm. uh, if we, whatever method we use to decompress and take our mind off of our toothache, it engages our parasympathetic nervous system and uh, really is very therapeutic. That's the essence of meditation. There's a, there's a company called Apollo, A-P-O-L-L-O, Neuroscience, who has a device now that you can literally put on your wrist and there are specific frequencies that stimulate your parasympathetic nervous system. So you contain a meditative state physiologically without actually meditating. Right. I've heard about that. Are you you using one of those? Because I was was actually interested to see what it actually felt like. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a very gentle buzzing, but it's mm. specifically tuned to activate the parasympathetic nervous system through the brainstem and the vagus nerve to the heart. And I use it at night to help me sleep. And, uh, and also it reduces anxiety. It's, it's a pretty phenomenal, it's the only wearable device that actually does something to you and not just measure a biomarker. Hmm. So follow neuroscience. It's a, it's a startup company here in Pittsburgh. That's actually really gaining a lot of momentum. Well, if you say if you say it works, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think the rest of us can be cynical. If we've got a one of the world leading neuroscientists and neurosurgeons saying that it that this thing works, I think uh, we'll take your word for it. I think uh, I need to reach out to them and have a look at it. It's a good. I know the people, and they're very good. All right. So I want to. I mean, you touched on the square, the the work, the family, social, spiritual, um, physical. Let's start with the body, the physical. Um, when you're talking with people or in the book and you suggest, how much physical kind of movement are you suggesting that most people get in? Not triathletes, but just your average type person. Well, you know, the, the general guidelines are 150 minutes a week or 35 to 45 minutes a day, uh, mm. three to four days a week. That should include some aerobic activity, even if it's just walking, uh, uh, along with um, with flexibility exercises, and and also resistance exercises. Resistance exercises are extremely important, particularly over forty, as as you know, sarcopenia develops, which is loss of muscle mass simply due to age and and lack of use. Mm-hmm. But with resistance exercises, in particular. You're able to maintain protein synthesis and maintain the uh, the development of our our muscles, and uh, and it becomes very important. So, a minimum of three to <clears throat> four or five days a week, uh, thirty to forty five minutes at a time. We also know that about one in ten people in the United States have diabetes or pre diabetes, and that diabetes is the most common cause of blindness kidney transplantation, and amputations in the United States. And if individuals would walk 35 to 45 minutes to an hour a day, three to four days a week, it could cut the incidence of diabetes by 30 to 40%. Just think of that. Think it's incredible. That impact that would have on health care, on mm. morbidity, mortality, and blindness. So it, it's... That's my answer to that. It's incredible, isn't it, when you when you bring up those sort of numbers? Why do you think it's not happening? Why why are why are we in a in a 
place where we're not hearing about that. We we hear the the news cycle and the media just ramming certain things down us. You know, I don't watch the news anymore actually, but it, it's a constant. But we never hear them talking about these. You know, get people moving. Um, nutrition. I think nutrition is a whole other conversation yeah. um, because people have access to uh, and it, what people have access to is, is very different throughout the country or in, out the world. But physical movement is, is one that we can all do. I mean, am I missing something here? Well, and this is, you know, my, one, one of my greatest difficulties is how how do you motivate they know that what's right but how do you motivate somebody to do it mm. and our whole society has begotten has gotten so mechanized we drive everywhere nobody uses a bike anymore uh you know even scooters to get around town uh and so everything is so in quotes easy we don't have to go. I mean, when I was growing up, you walked, ran, or biked every place, mm. uh, and and now that's not the case. And you, in biking, you got to be careful. I see an awful mm. lot of patients hit by cars and too many visits to the ER as well. So the safety aspect of it, but it's a, uh, you know, it's a problem of getting people to. You know, it's the executive cortex versus the amygdala. Mm. Uh, <laughs> to, to motivate people uh, on an emotional basis that you're going to feel better, you're going to work better, you're going to think better, you're going to live longer versus, well, I'll have that second gin and tonic tonight or that third plate of pasta. Exactly. Um, and, and, and then it just gets to the point that they have their, their heart attack or something and, and some people are scared into physically moving. A quick mini break. I really want to encourage you to do something special for yourself and sign up to Athletic Greens and get a free year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase by visiting athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. Again, that's athleticgreens.com forward slash Greg. Greg. High Price now have a great holiday sale. $50 off Hypervolt and Hypervolt Plus, $400 off all normal tech packages, 20% off all other High Price tech, and the brand new Hypervolt Go is now available for $199. It's smaller and it's more portable. Hyperice.com. That's Hyperice.com. H-Y-P-E-R-I-C-E.com. You can't really motivate somebody else. I mean, motivation really does come from within, doesn't it? I mean, you, you, you try and educate the best you can, but motivation is one of those things that if, if somebody doesn't have it, it's very difficult. You can try and be an inspiration, but generally speaking, it has to come from within. Um, what about nu nutrition? I mean, talking about the body and wh where are you at these days with your diet and, and, and what are you kind of s suggesting people have nutritionally? Well, I'm anxious to hear your comments on this as well. All right. <laughs> I, I've, I've gone through primarily a vegan diet. I, mm. I've looked into significantly the ketogenic diet and uh, the importance of that. And I know there are some triathletes who are both use that exclusively. I've, I, I've uh, gotten to really the Mediterranean diet, uh, high in vegetables, fruits, uh, nuts, grains, lean protein, chicken, a lot of fish, a lot of salmon, but frozen salmon from Alaska, not farm raised salmon. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and, and occasional meat once or twice a month, uh, beef, and then, uh, a significant number of, of supplements that I take. And, uh, and then intermittent fasting, I'll, 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 I'll try to go when I can, uh, the 1824 situation where I'll yep. eat only at that time when I'm training, I find that hard to do. Uh, I, I either psychological or whatever. I, I feel like I need a, a steady, a steady stream of of good food to keep me going strong. But uh, 
on a, on a daily basis, I'll end up working out an hour, hour and a half or two a day. And then on weekends more, uh, and it, it fits me very well. The Mediterranean diet with a, occasionally a glass of wine and, uh, a lot of olive oil on, on things. And so that's about how I do it. Mm. I think, I think, uh, we're very similar. I think, don't get me wrong. I think I have my cheat days and I, uh, I always tell everybody it's probably more like 80, 20. Um, but generally speaking, we have a, a very protein focused diet. Mm-hmm. So we're, we're having, um, some form of meat, usually, um, at least two of the meals a day. Um, <clears throat> like you, we get the, we get the Pacific salmon sent to us from, uh, I think Laura uses a company called vital choice actually. Same I one we, I use. Same one. Yeah. I think we're affiliates to that company. So I'll, I'll put that in the show notes for people if they want to, I think we get a, can get you a discount with them. Um, Good. and then, yeah. And otherwise, you know, I try and I don't, I wouldn't say I'm keto. I definitely would say I try to be conscious about my carbohydrate and definitely my sugar intake. Um, I'm a, I'm a conscious eater. I would say that's my diet these days. It's understanding that too many carbohydrates are inflammatory, uh, mm-hmm. refined sugars, inflammatory. I don't want the inflammation in, in my body. Yeah. Um, and so th- that's not to say I don't touch those things. You know, it's just, I'm recognizing I don't snack like I used to. And I think that's the trouble we get to. It's not that you have to be so hardcore about a certain diet or whatever. It's just being conscious when you're having that cake. or Because I don't want to be the person that gets invited to a wedding and doesn't have a piece of the wedding cake. Do you know what I mean? It's like I, I still believe there's a time and place to celebrate that food is part of the whole societal norms and the way we play together. But at the same time, when I'm home with the kids and we're in our routine, yeah, let, let's let's be moderation and be conscious eating on all of those things. And you mentioned supplementation. Um, this is an area that as an athlete, when I was a professional athlete, I didn't actually supplement a lot. I had D-ribose quite often. Um, oh, that was the other product uh, I used during this past two weeks. I used D-ribose for my mitochondria, uh, for my energy and boy, I found it helped while I was sort of knocked in bed with this COVID thing. So that was the other one. I, they're not a sponsor anymore. That It's just a product that I found was um, quite useful. But tell me about some of your supplements and things that you're using. Well, I think really it's interesting you'd ask. The most significant supplement that I've recently discovered is uh, a, a, pros, a, a, a substance called glytine, G-L-Y-E-Y-N-E. <laughs> And yeah, they're a, they're a sponsor of this show, actually. So, people, if you heard me talking about it at the start of the show, but please go on because this is something that I'm using myself religiously. Yeah, and and basically, it's a a precursor to glutathione. Mm-hmm. And as as this audience knows, uh, in the conversion of oxygen and glucose to ATP, free radicals uh, are created. And uh, these free radicals generate, uh, are, are somewhat toxic to the mitochondria that make the ATP, our energy sources. <clears throat> and they're usually squelched, if you would, by antioxidants. And one of these, and probably the master antioxidant, is glutathione. So how do you get glutathione? Well, you can get it in your diet from cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, eggs, nuts, legumes, have some. But as we get older, as we and as we exercise even harder, uh, we generate more free radicals, we damage more mitochondria, and, and, and we get all sorts of problems therein. So glytine is a very unique product that is uh, that is formed from three amino acids, glutamate, cysteine, and glycine. So these particular amino acids usually come together and form glutathione. But as we get older or as we consume alcohol or increased anxiety and stress, and as you said, Greg, sickness, Mm -hmm. uh, it's optimal to supplement with glutathione enhancement 
uh, products. Now, some people actually get glutathione IV uh, to increase their their uh, glutathione levels, and it's important for the audience to to recognize that glutathione is entirely intracellular. In other words, it's in every cell of our body, and it's formed in a two-step reaction in each cell. The first step is glutamate and cysteine, two of the amino acids, are joined together by a specific enzyme called glutamate cysteine ligase that you don't have to really guess. You just remember that glutamate and cysteine need to be uh, enzymatically connected. And then in the second step, another enzyme, glutathione synthetase, adds the amino acid cysteine to the others to form GSH. So as we get older, this first step is blocked, doesn't occur, and aging, alcohol consumption, heavy exercise. And this system becomes dysfunctional. Glytine is a compound that's made up, and, and nobody will remember this, but it's called gamma glutamyl cysteine, which passes into the cells and intracellularly links up to form the glutathione. Now, when individuals get IV glutathione, thinking, gee, how can it get any better into my cells? Extremely important to recognize that the intracellular content of glutathione is in millimoles, millimoles. The extracellular, cell, extracellular content, when you put it in the vein, in IV, is in micromoles. So you have a thousand-fold differential between the intracellular and the extracellular compartments. So you really, even with IV, you're really not getting a, that significant amount of enhancement of your glutathione production. Mm. So quite frankly, I, I found that taking this, and I've been taking it for probably six months now, my energy level uh, is, is significantly enhanced. And uh, I'm actually working with an investigator in India at a brain research institute there and we, we, we want to actually prove that the glutathione in, in glycine crosses the blood-brain barrier and enters the, the brain cells. Now, why is that important? Well, when you consider Alzheimer's disease, hmm. one of the main problems in Alzheimer's disease is mitochondrial dysfunction. And one of the main causes of mitochondrial dysfunction is oxidative stress. So we believe that glycine, glutamyl, gamma glutamyl cysteine mm. crosses the blood brain barrier and can enhance the glutathione production in the brain, which is critical in the brain. And we believe that it can enhance cognitive function and neuroplasticity. And, and, and processing of information. So we're, we're looking to confirm that actually in, in actual clinical studies. Uh, wow. So that's, that's my little. Do you think, do you think it could, are you, are you thinking in the lines that it could reduce the symptoms of Alzheimer's or delay the onset of Alzheimer's? But if people, if somebody's already got Alzheimer's, are you, Seeing that, are you saying that it potentially could turn them around? Well, I'm not. I'm saying I'm not saying it's curative. No, no, no. Okay. You know, when somebody gets Alzheimer's disease, they've already have a a huge burden of beta amyloid and 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 neurofibrillary tangles, which are the hallmarks pathologically of all of Alzheimer's disease, and that's not reversible. So, but might it assist or might it protect? might it facilitate neuroprotection of other neurons? I, I, yeah. I would speculate and say, I think it might. I, I think this needs to be proven scientifically, 
And, and quite frankly, we're looking to try to do that. That's phenomenal. I, I heard the other day or I read the other day that when the elderly population, they did a study on and said, what, do, you know, what scares you mo- most? Um, and death was second. And Alzheimer's was number one. Yeah, you know, and, and and so you you're touching on something that is the number one thing that is an aging population are most fearful of. And if we could be looking at, you know, glycine, the these products that are going to a, a affect the brain in such a way, wow, wouldn't that be incredible? Well, I, I think you know I've written a few a few articles. You can go to my website. Mm. Uh, josephmaroon.com <clears throat> and, and I've recently written a couple of articles on protection against Alzheimer's disease and okay. an enhancement of, of brain function and everything we're talking about also delays and protects against dementia so what are the factors the most significant factors in protecting or preventing Alzheimer's and, and dementing diseases. Number one is sleep. Good mm-hmm. sleep. At when we sleep, uh, it, it's we we get rid of the detritus and the accumulation of of bad products in our brain. It's a cleansing. It's like a sweeper goes through our brain and picks up the the bad products. It's called autophagy. <laughs> I like that. I like the analogy. It, when, when it comes to sleep, are you doing anything to enhance your ability to go to sleep quicker and then stay asleep? Well, I, you know, I do. I use melatonin. <clears throat> and, and one of my colleagues, Robert Friedlander, is the chief of neurosurgery here at the University of Pittsburgh and has been studying melatonin for several years in the laboratory. And, uh, you know, it, it, melatonin is one of the, in quotes, and I use this loosely, but anti-aging hormones. Uh, you know, it, it facilitates sleep, but it also enhances immunity and also has an anti-inflammatory effect. And, uh, uh, and, and it's very benign and innocuous in terms of uh, side effects. So it does is conducive to sleep. So... I do that. I don't eat. How, how much melatonin do you take? Pardon me? How much melatonin do you I take? I take 20 milligrams a night, which is high. Most mm. people recommend three to six milligrams. Mm. But but I, I, from the work that I've read, I believe there may be some uh, uh, heightened immunity and, and immunomodulatory factors that uh, I, I take a little higher dose. Okay. Interesting. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so sleep is one thing, and our diet, and and you hit on it earlier, Greg, about an inflammatory diet. Well, what's an inflammatory diet? Well, if you get a splinter under your finger, what happens to your finger? It gets red hot, tender, and swollen. Mm-hmm. That's the body's innate immune response protecting you against a puncture wound bacteria that may enter. Well, what happens when you eat a Big Mac uh, infused with hormones and antibiotics, raised on corn, not grass, sprayed with glyphosate, and wash it down with a bottle of phosphoric acid, which is coke, (laughs) and then have trans fatty acids on your French fries? That's how they should just package all of this. <laughs> so what what is that what's that going to do genetically in terms of inflammation? Well these these factors are going to tell your genes via via various transcription factors to make inflammatory cytokines. The same cytokines and chemokines that causes your finger to be red hot tender and swollen. Well, this is what happens to the intima of your blood vessels, the lining of your blood vessels, and also in your brain, your kidneys and your and your liver and heart. That is an inflammatory diet. What happens if you eat an anti-inflammatory diet like we spoke about? 
Well, your body makes anti-inflammatory agents and cytokines that squelch the free radicals, that reduce the inflammation, and that gives your body a much better chance of healing on its own when there's an insult. So sleep, diet, social interaction with friends and family is a very, a very other important Alzheimer disease preventive. And then just like our muscles, use it or lose it. However you use your brain, crossword puzzles, Sudoku, uh, what we're doing, what you're doing every day to stimulate your body and your brain are all factors that contribute to the reduction of dementia. Hmm. Uh, so, and then prayer, spirituality, uh, meditation are all factors that anyone doing Alzheimer's disease research work will tell you consistently done beginning in middle age, because that's when Alzheimer's disease really begins 20, 20 years before it's really diagnosed in most cases. Is that right? Yeah. So wow. it, there's, it, you, you really got to start early of it and then it's never too late. You've mentioned social a couple of times and this one intrigues me, especially when we've had a year of lockdown and isolation being sort of thrown at us as, as, as critical to, you know, flatten the curve and everything else. But the, the impacts on when we talk socialization, now, when I talk to my mum, who I'd love to go visit, you know, she's in, in Sydney, Australia, but I can't get back without doing a two-week quarantine with a one- and three-year-old, and I'm not going to be stuck in a hotel room with a one- and a three-year-old, so we're kind of waiting until they can kind of do a home quarantining or, or, or anything else that might be a little bit of common sense. But when we talk social, is there a, a human interaction? Is there, is there a, to hug one another, to, to be closer to one another, is there something – in terms of neuroscience that, that's actually going on there that's a healing process for us? There absolutely is. Uh, touch in particular is very therapeutic, you know, mm. therapeutic touch. One of the things, you know, one, one of the most stressful times in any individual is when they're lying on a gurney about to be wheeled into an operating room to have their brain or spine operated upon. Mm. And for many years, I've had the habit of not proselytizing or try to convert anybody, but I'll ask them if they believe in a higher being, they believe in God. And would you like to say a prayer before being wheeled into the operating room? And 80% of people or higher will say, sure, I'd love to say a prayer with you. Mm. So I always take their hand and touch them and say, today is the day the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And with your help, get Mary or John back to her family, back to her children and back to, back to her life. Well, saying that, Greg, you can see the cortisol levels going down. You can see the anxiety and the fears diminishing. And that anxiety and fear being reduced reduces the average hospital stay, reduces the infection rate, reduces the stress, and enhances the confidence of a patient. Wow. I can't tell you the number of comments I've had, not for successful surgery, but just a note saying, doctor, I want to thank you for saying that prayer with me before we went into the operating room. It made such a difference for me. Mm -hmm. So touch and communication physiologically has several substrates. Number one, it has a de definite effect on the Again, our amygdala, our emotional centers of our brain, which are connected to our hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, our pituitary gland, which releases oxytocin. And oxytocin is the same hormone that bonds the baby to the, to the mother. 
in in the suckling of the nur- of the nurturing of the baby oxytocin mm-hmm. is released which is that bonding calming loving hormone and feeling so this is what happens also when you look into the eyes of someone you love or care about there's an endocrine reaction that is really totally unconscious but it elicits calming, soothing, warm, loving feelings. So, and this is all obviously, as you know, 80, 90% of what we convey is nonverbal. It's not verbal, but it's touch, it's, it's, it's looking, it's smell, olfactory sense is huge in how do we relate to other people. So, in all of these senses, our five senses, visual, uh, smell, auditory, taste, touch, all of these five senses are inputted into our brain that is constantly changing. And that's called neuroplasticity. Heraclitus was a Greek philosopher, 500 BC, who said, you can never put your foot into the same river twice. Think about that, Greg. Why can't you put your foot into the same river twice? It's because the river is constantly moving. Hmm. Think about your brain is constantly evolving and changing. Every sensory input that you have is making new synaptic connections and new new fiber tracks in our brain between our executive and our emotional brains. So that that's the essence of neuroplasticity. Mm, It's always evolving. I love that. It's kind of, we've sort of talked about, I've had a number of guests, whether they be coaches or athletes, and and we all find that our routine and, but then we kind of say, what was working for us yesterday doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for us tomorrow because we're a day older, you know, and our body has changed. And it's the same with the brain. The neuroplasticity of the brain is constantly changing. It's constantly, we're constantly having to manage it. You know, I, I don't, you know, you go through phases where you feel incredi- incredibly confident and the world is coming easy and you, we all go through phases where, you know, Life's tough. We feel sad. I think depression kicks in for many. And it's this constant wave of just going up and down and up and down. And and, I mean, I guess at the end of the day, we just call it life. (laughs) It's it's a struggle at times and we do the best. And it's like you said earlier, we overcome the struggles and the stress and we become stronger. Uh, Life isn't always perfect. Um, you know, I've kind of resolved myself to the fact that life is meant to be somewhat of a struggle. And if you start there, then, you know, this this whole searching for happiness the whole time, I think I'm far more about reducing the neg- negativity, uh, reducing the noise and being present and allowing happiness to happen to us, um, but stop searching for happiness because otherwise it makes you miserable. So I, I've kind of got myself, I believe, I'm a big believer in sort of trying to find neutral. Um, and, and on that, tell me a bit about, do you have a morning routine that you follow these days along these principles that we've discussed? Um, well, basically, you know, I, in the morning I get, I usually have a breakfast of steel cut oatmeal and blueberries, nuts, chia seeds, uh, green tea. And quite frankly, every day I put with my green tea, I put glycine in it. Um, mm-hmm. I, I like the taste of the st- there's stevia in in the glycine. Yeah, it's it's kind of sweet that glycine, yeah, isn't it? It's a little sweet, and I, I've gotten yeah. to the point where I I really like that. Depending on my commitments for the day, uh, I may work out before breakfast, uh, or wait until the late afternoon or evening, and and that will vary depending on what I feel like doing that day: walking, jogging. Uh, indoor bike on my trainer, go to the local Y for a swim. Uh, lunch is usually a salad with some protein. Uh, and then dinner is more protein, salad, vegetables, fruits, 
uh, this and that. And, and then connecting with my kids in some way or another, phone call, email, something on a daily basis. And uh, uh, so I, I touched my work side, my family side, and the spiritual side I mentioned, you know, as a physician, I'm very blessed being able to bring the, the spirituality in to my work uh, in a very positive way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also at, at, I, the other in, s- incredibly important uh, factor, character trait is gratitude. Mm. Gratitude and kindness. Uh, mm. At this point, uh, I'm, I can't tell you how grateful I am for simply being to be able to be on this show, Greg, and talking about what we're talking about at a pretty high level. And, and being able to work with professional athletes, as I do with the, with the Steelers and the World Wrestling Entertainment Foundation, where I'm medical director. And, and to be able to act and interact with, with these elite athletes like yourself and at a level that I'm able to bring my own experiences and expertise to make a difference in their lives. There's a, a saying, we give but little when we give of our possessions, it's when we give of ourselves that we truly give. And I'm, I'm at a point where I'm able to do that uh, and, and really be able to make a difference and, and able to assist people. And I'm so grateful and thankful for that, knowing that, you know, I, I see the bullets going by. And you know, I see my friends dropping out, so to speak, mm. uh, dropping off. And I, I know that that day is going to happen. Uh, but I also know that, uh, you know, I do not want to go gentle into that good night. <laughs> I well, it's, I want to it, rage and rage against the dying of the light. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. If there's not an inspiring quote in this whole <laughs> podcast, you know, it's funny. I, I've I've said to my wife Laura many times, uh, especially this past year, the one thing I've always been incredibly certain of is that I'm going to die. I've I've never you're for gonna, a moment you're not getting and, out of it. But I but I I've, and I've never. I've never been fearful of it. For me, it's just, it will happen. But saying it out loud, and I often do well before this past year, you know, it was, I'm going to die, is the greatest fuel to live. Yeah. And if you, we've all had death around us, you know, family members or friends or whatever, it's a constant. And I always find when somebody dies, it triggers me again. It's like that little slap, that little wake up to live. You know, this is your time to live. You have now, and you will die. We all will die. And it, but I love the way you put it, though. It's <laughs> going to rage until, uh, you know. And you mentioned gratitude, and and first of all, I, the gratitude is all mine to have you on this show. It's just absolutely incredible to to listen to you speak, and um, I'm really looking forward to when we can actually do this in person one day, and and just sit down and, and share a glass of wine and, and discuss. But for now, it's over the podcast. So the the gratitude is all mine and, and people that listen to this podcast would have heard me say often that I, I practice gratitude often just washing my hands. I'll go through 20 or 30 things as quickly as I can. It's amazing how it can affect my attitude immediately that if I just go through and that might be my health, my strength, my blah, 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 my wife, my kids, you know, whatever it is, list them off and immediately you're, you're walking a foot taller you have a smile on your face yeah. and and you can really make big change by just doing that um i was you mentioned you, you, your family I, I was curious you know after you said you know after you you burn out and you you sort of your family left you what the relationship was was like now um so it was wonderful to hear that you you've you've got your kids in your life um, have you got grandkids pardon me you got grandkids yes i have one uh, nine years old and, and doing well, but I, and, and my kids are all doing, thank God, very healthy and well and, and, and mm. moving along. 
I, I want to you something you triggered something in my mind uh, about things. What's important, Greg? And I remember the first Iron Man I did in Hawaii was in 1993. 1993, and it was the most the most difficult thing I've ever attempted in my life at that time, uh, you know, pushing that rock up the hill like Sisyphus. And I, uh, after that, I, I, I went back and I went to a cabin in the woods and I said, why in the world did I torture myself and push myself to, to do this? You know, what's it all about? And I came up with three of the most important things in life. So if I asked you, Greg, and rhetorically the audience, you know, what are the three most important things in your life right now? And I came up with, with three. Number one is a healthy mind in a healthy body. The Romans said, mensana incorpore sano. Nothing new. Back to the ancient Greeks, Romans, a healthy mind in a healthy body. Without that, the rest of the life is in shallows and in misery, as Shakespeare said. That's number one. Number two is relationships. Relationships with God, family, and friends. For the reasons we said. God, family, and friends. A purpose and your family and friends. And number three is carpe diem. <laughs> Seize the day. And, and that's where, when I was talking about gratitude, you know, I, it's carpe diem every day. You know, I, I wake up in bed and I say, well, my, my legs are still moving. I can move my arms and, uh, my brain is <laughs> processing information again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. I can do another one. Yeah. I think that's fantastic. I mean, uh, like I mentioned, my father-in-law, he, he's often talking about, you know, the age group that you guys are in and and you mentioned it, you know, some of them, suddenly he's, you know, if you finish, you're winning the age group, you know, yeah. he's, he's lost a couple of mates either, you know, not necessarily dying, but they're, they're you know, knees are gone or whatever and uh, it's just, I think he's much the same. Every day it's like, okay. Yeah. I'm still here. I can still have my turn. Let's do this. And I find you guys just some of the most inspiring people on the planet. Um, so I can't thank you enough for coming on the show. I think this is a good place to to wind it up. Now, where, where, where can people follow you? Um, you've mentioned your website. I'll put it all in the show notes. Um, yeah. do, you, do you do social media channels and things like that? Or uh, I, I uh, Mostly my my. Uh, Joseph.com is my website and everything can be found there. Uh, to order the book, uh, yes. Square One, A Simple Guide to a Balanced Life, just maroonsquareone.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, happy to answer any questions by email. My email address is on my website. And uh, any way I can help anybody, I'm here. I, I this has been absolutely brilliant. I, you have the most incredible bedside manner. I, I think anybody that's going under the knife to know that, you know, to have you, I think they're incredibly fortunate. I, I feel incredibly thankful to have you on the show for this last hour 15 that we've been able to chat. Um, I feel like we've become friends, we're mates, and I hope going forward we can have more conversations like this because this was very, very special. So thank you so much for coming on the show, I, Dr. Joseph. My great Joseph. pleasure, and I, I learned from you as well, Greg. Appreciate your efforts and everything you do to educate people. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for everybody for listening. Now you can find all the timestamps and show notes and coupon codes for the sponsors and all the links at bennettendurance.com forward slash media. All right. Thank you so much again. Stay on the line. This was absolutely a blast. Oh. Cheers. Thanks a lot for listening. If you enjoyed the show, your support would truly be appreciated. You can visit the Patreon page or you can subscribe with your podcast app of choice. Don't miss the next episode. So subscribe and be notified. For show notes, if you want to know more, please visit BennettEndurance.com. I'm Phil Liggett, and on behalf of Greg Bennett, 
Here's to the next time, and I hope you will join Greg again very soon.